and as they're turning there, I'm thankful for uh, the, the crew that came out yesterday to hand out gospel tracts. We've been systematically covering um, different uh, neighborhoods from our church, working our way outward, and um, we've been able to get some, some, some material out to the community and just keep on doing that and doing that and just sowing the seed. Uh, we use an app, actually, um, called the Soul Winning app. It's um, the guy who made it, actually, um, is uh, some of you know um, Brother Spratt's granddaughter, Miss Laura. Um, her husband, Brad, is the one that actually made the app for this, and he uses it for um, um, for people who do sales, and they charge a pretty you know heavy price for the sales teams. But he made it super cheap for churches to use to be able to to do it, and uh, so that's the app that we use, and uh, it's pretty neat. So I appreciate everyone that went out yesterday to go door knocking and invite people to, to church and to um, hand out some, some door hangers and so forth. I appreciate that. And uh, we have a, a couple other announcements here. This coming Wednesday is our Senior Saints Fellowship. We didn't have it last month, but we have it this coming Wednesday is Senior Saints. And so, but I'd encourage you, if you have the church calendar, on the side of it, it has a strip like this. I cut it out myself and I keep it in my Bible for, for me. But it has a strip. It has all the different events in the church beside the holidays. The holidays are highlighted on the calendar, but all the different events there. And just go through and look at it every month, and you can see all the different events coming up that we have. And so we have uh, things like work days, which will be um, next Saturday. We have a workers' meeting for all the people that are involved in our ministry. Um, Sunday night after church, women's fellowship, outreach, all these different things that we line out. And so it's, a, it's funny, though, because people always ask, well, when is this? What, what day is this? And, and like, we have our calendar. And so you got the calendar. You put it on the fridge, and you go there multiple times a day. And so it always cracks me up how that is. And, and the funny thing is, too, I, I still get messages, what time is it? What time is it? And, and it's on the thing there, too. And so it cracks me up um, because we're humans, and we... Um, we skip over things like that, but I'd encourage you to go through that and uh, be able to, to mark the different events that we have uh, coming up here. And uh, looking forward to our Senior Saints Fellowship. Uh, uh, that, that was, a, for me, just personally, there were a couple priorities when we came here. One was to get the missions program in order, uh, but another thing, and I haven't expressed this really, but was to, because I know we don't have our Senior Saints Sunday School class, but I wanted to do something with our senior saints, and that was to me really a priority because a majority of the, of the people there are the people that helped build this ministry through the years, and I wanted to just recognize that, but also we have other seniors that have come along uh, throughout the most recent years, and I'm thankful for all our seniors, amen, and so it was a priority for me to, to get that in order. So um, Romans chapter number eight this morning, and uh, we're going to read just a, a portion here, but then we're going to continue to be um, throughout the rest of this chapter. And we're in between different things in our Sunday school hour. Um, we have a service to follow here at uh, 11, and, and we're going through the Gospel of John, and we're going to continue uh, with that. And obviously, we'll preach about the Lord Jesus um, here coming up as we celebrate His resurrection. But uh, today, this is just an off, um, not an off, but a, um, out of the normal lesson today because we've already gone all the way through the Bible and uh, now we're going to start another series here in a couple weeks of some things and so um, I'm kind of just teaching just some lessons just in general here so I hope this is an encouragement to you the the title of this is uh, promises of faith uh, promises of faith and so we'll start in Romans chapter 8 and verse 24 Romans chapter 8 and verse number 24 the Bible says, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen not but hope that is seen is not hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according 
to his purpose. And um, let's go ahead and pray this morning, and we'll ask God's blessing upon our lesson here today. Father, as we come to you, Lord, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you for what we learned from it. And God, I pray that you take your word this morning and encourage your people. God, I pray that you'd help us to, to see your word for what it is and strengthen us, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to be um, convicted where we need it, Lord. We're comforted where we need it as well. God bless us, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When you read the book of Romans, it's a very uh, deep book. And we know this book in particular was written by Paul the Apostle uh, to the church that was at Rome. And there's a few things to, to note here about the church of Rome. Um, this is not the Roman Catholic church. Um, in fact, you know, Peter is said to be the first pope. Peter never pastored in Rome itself. And uh, there was another pastor that was there. And uh, Paul writes to this church, and with the exception of Paul and his uh, persecution where he actually ended up imprisoned in Rome, um, Paul never went to Rome to, to go and plant a church or, or anything like that. In fact, he writes this letter and he tells them, look, I'm not trying to lay upon another man's foundation. Um, I, I just want to go in and preach the gospel to you and, and be a help to you. And, and when you read the book of Romans, that's what this whole book is about. He just is giving them the gospel and he's encouraging them. And so you read the book of Romans and it's really a book of, of doctrine. It's a deep book, but it's a book about the gospel and it's a book about our faith in the Lord. Uh, just uh, recently, a man reached out to me on um, Instagram. And he says, may I ask you a few questions? And I said, sure. And he says, I'm an ex-Protestant and I've joined an Orthodox church and I want to know what you believe about this, this, and this. And, and I said, well, I'll tell you what I believe based on the scriptures. And he kept asking, well, what about the fathers? What about the church fathers? And, and I said, well, which church fathers are you talking about? Well, the fathers. And I said, I don't know which fathers you're talking about. Um, besides that, Jesus said not to call any man father. Um, besides the heavenly father and obviously your own father. But, you know, you're supposed to honor your father and your mother. But um, he said, well, what do you believe about faith? Is it by works or is it by faith? And I said, it's by faith. And then I began to show him out of Romans uh, what it meant to be saved by faith. And uh, he said, I just want to make sure that um, leaving Protestantism to orthodoxy is right. And I said, to be honest, that's, if you're trying to trust your works, that's not right. You need to be saved by faith. That's what saves. And, and uh, he stopped messaging me after a while, but uh, I just wanted to you know, help him and understand that, that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what the book of Romans deals with. And it talks about Abraham and his faith and how that was counted to him for righteousness. You read the book of Hebrews and, and there's an entire chapter dedicated to uh, saving faith and people who, who believed God and, and by faith they did this and they did that. And, and then you see God uh, blessing them because of the things they did by faith. And, and, and the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And so um, Romans chapter 8, it, it deals with promises that we have because of our faith in the Lord. And when you read this, this chapter actually starts off um, talking about just how, how we have the righteousness of God. And it's a blessing. In fact, Romans 8, 1, it says, um, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And, and you see here that we're not condemned. Um, we, we have been saved by faith. And and now we're to walk in the spirit and, and not in our flesh. And, and when you begin to read the, the, the idea of the flesh, it's more than just the sin that we commit because of our flesh. I'll say this much. If you're trusting your works to save you, that is a fleshly thing because it's something you're doing in the flesh. And we're not to... We're not saved by the, the deeds of the law. We're not saved by the work that we do. We're not saved by the good that we, we perform. Uh, we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. And because of that, um, we're not condemned. The Bible says, uh, he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so we have our faith that saves. And the um, Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, and so we see here, um, we're to be saved and we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Not of us, all of him and what he did. And so when you get saved, 
there's some promises that are offered. Now, let me just stop and also mention, just because you are saved doesn't necessarily mean you'll realize all that God has promised. You say, why is that? Well, if we're not living in the ways of the world, in the ways of God, why would God want to, to bless? There's some consequences to choices that we make. We should strive to follow God and strive to follow His Word and strive to follow His ways. But when we're walking that narrow path and when we're walking with the Lord, there's a lot of promises that God has made available. So we're going to see here um, four promises in this passage. I really want to labor in, in one part, but I want to look at all parts here. So back in Romans 8, verse 24 and 25, the first thing we see here is the hope that we have. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and verse 25, the Bible says, For we are saved by hope. Now, when you think about this, you know, often in our modern society, when people use the word hope, it really means wish. You know, I hope this happens. I hope, you know, I get a catch a fish whenever I go out fishing. Hey, man, it's like a wish. I hope I get something when I go out hunting. I hope I get all green lights whenever I'm driving down the road. Who, who hopes for that? Hey, man, there's some places when you go downtown, it's almost like they, they, they stagger it on purpose just so you get red light after red light. And, you know, I hope I get all the greens. I, I hope this. I hope that. And, and in reality, when you look at the word hope in the Bible, it's not a wish. It's just something that hasn't happened yet. And so we're believing it by faith. We're expecting it uh, to happen. The Bible says uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We, we trust that it is going to happen. We, we believe it. We have hope. It's, 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 a, it's a firm faith. And, and it says that's how we're saved, by hope. And so that, that's that faith in the Lord. And so it says, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, um, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So we, we're saved by hope. We have this faith in the Lord, but then we have something more to hope for. Now, when you read, again, this whole chapter deals with the resurrection, not the chapter of this book, it deals with the resurrection of Christ. We believe he died for us. We believe he rose from the dead. But we believe he ascended to heaven. We believe he's coming back again. And now that is called the blessed hope. We're looking forward to that. And we haven't seen it yet, but we're looking forward to it. And when I think about that, you know, the more and more, more this world continues on, the more and more I want the Lord to return. It just As you see all that happens, and, and I'll say this much, that the world that I grew up in is not the world that we're living in today. And, and I'm going to be 40 years old. Um, I know there's some people in, in our room that, you know, that they're beyond that. And the world you grew up in was not the world I grew up in. And the world I grew up in is not the world that we're living in today. And, and it's such a big difference about just, you know, just morals and, and, and right and wrong and, and people having integrity and, and all these different things that are, are out there. And, and I don't have to express a lot to for us to realize that uh, we live in a sinful world and there are people that are hurtful and hateful and uh, we were talking i was talking about this with a, a friend of mine the, a fishing guide and and he was talking about just the, the ms-13 and the gangs and the cartels and and things like that and, and you get to studying or seeing what some of these people do they are proud of their violence to the point where what they do violently is extremely extremely um, inhumane, um, just what they do, how, how, how they torture people, how they kill people, how they display um, their, their, their work and so forth. And, and I look at that and, and it's obvious we live in a very sinful world. The Bible says the love of many will wax cold and, and, and so forth. And we know that it's going to get darker and darker and darker. And, and the more we see that, it can get discouraging to see what's going on in this world. But the fact is this, that um, we hope for Jesus to come again. And the Bible calls that our blessed hope. We have someone to look forward to. And he's going to take us out of this place. And I'm thankful for that. And I trust the Lord will 
As John says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I, I want the Lord uh, to come and take us. You know, all of our, our children have made professions of faith. I've been able to see some of my, my family get saved, and, and I, I'm ready to, to move forward. Amen. And for a while there, I didn't want to move forward because I wanted to make sure I knew people knew the Lord. But, but as these people are starting to make professions of faith, and we see that, it's like I'm, I'm ready uh, to move forward now with this. And I hope uh, for the Lord uh, to return. Now, Jesus said, as we already observed the Lord's Supper last week, how that, uh, he said, I'm not going to drink this cup with you till I drink it new with you again. And he gave a promise of his return in that. Even when Jesus, after he ascended to heaven, the angels said, uh, the same Jesus that was taken up from you shall return in like manner. We we're looking forward to that. That's the next thing we're looking forward to. That is our hope in this world. And, and I'm thankful uh, for that hope that we have. And that, that's a hope every believer has every believer has um, now let's go in our Bibles to Romans 8 verses 26 and 27 the, the Bible says there likewise the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered now notice it's the spirit that's making the groanings. It's the Spirit that's making intercession. I've seen people take that verse and, and that's where they start saying, well, you got to pray in a different tongue and it's groanings that can't be uttered. No, it's the Spirit of God that's doing the work and, and, and making intercession for us. Verse number 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, when you read that, it tells us that there's times in our life when we pray, but really we don't even know what to pray for. Sometimes the problem's so big, we can't even get the words out to, for it to make any kind of sense. And in those moments, the Spirit takes that brokenness and He intercedes on our behalf. And He speaks to the Lord, uh, to, to the Father, in a way that only He can according to the will of God. And I'm thankful that um, you know, the Spirit of God helps translate my broken heart. Amen. I'm thankful the Spirit of God helps translate the needs that I have because sometimes I don't even know what to pray. It's one of those things sometimes like I don't even know where to begin. You ever have one of those days where it just a bunch of stuff happens and someone tells you what's wrong, you can tell me and you're like, I don't even know where to start. Like it's just that that much going on and, and when you look at that on another level, when we come to the Father and we go to pray, sometimes that's how it is because it's just too overwhelming. And the Bible talks about that, you know, when I'm overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And, and sometimes we feel overwhelmed. And, and yet in that feeling of, of, of being overwhelmed, uh, we, we are heard by the Lord still. So first we have hope. Uh, secondly, uh, we are heard by God. God hears our prayer even when we can't get the words out. I'm thankful that God hears our prayer. I'm reminded of a preacher that I knew. He was, they were having their fourth child, and uh, and they were in the emergency room, and, and uh, they'd have the baby a little bit. They had their first three kids, and then the fourth one came a little bit later on, so she was a little bit older compared to when she had her first children, so her body just was struggling in, in uh, burying a child and in childbirth, and there came a moment where her blood pressure dropped, the baby's blood pressure dropped. She passed out. They're trying to do everything they can and the husband's in there you know they're you know you know just push and all that kind of stuff and all of a sudden she's just fainted and she's knocked out and the baby's blood pressure dropping and you know buzzers are going off and beeps and you know, all this stuff and and the, and the preacher you know just he got down on his knees right there in the in the room and he began to try to pray and he's i, I don't even know i didn't even know what to pray and i just started crying because I, I thought my wife was going to die i thought my baby was going to die this was, he was so afraid and and he just cried literally just cried and one of the nurses was trying to push him out of the way and the doctor said he's doing business with god um leave him there amen and so we were gonna uh, you know they, they did their part but they knew that god had to do his part uh, thankfully the woman came to and the baby was born and now the baby is uh, now 30 years old amen so um, god's been good there but Sometimes that's how prayer is, where you don't even know what to pray, but yet God still hears that, that cry that's in our heart, and he does that 
uh, through His Spirit, as we have talked about even, you know, the, the, the comforts of, of, of God. We talked about that last week and how that we, you know, the multitude of my thoughts, uh, I'm comforted with His delights. And, you know, God has given us His comforter. Uh, the comfort comforts us in, in pain and trials and hardship. That's His Spirit. Um, but, but the same one who comforts is the same one who helps us in our prayer that's why the bible says that we pray in the holy ghost amen we're to to walk with god and seek to be uh, filled with the spirit of god and and we're to pray according to god's will but seeking his spirit to work in our lives as we pray and i'm thankful that he makes the intercession uh, for us and he helps whenever it seems like we don't know how to pray or what to pray uh, we still see him helping us in our prayer so we have hope we are heard and then Third, um, we have help of the Lord. This is a promise that we have um, based on our faith. Now, I'll, I'll note this much as Romans 8, 28. Everyone knows this verse. It says, and we know that all things work together for good. But it doesn't stop there. A lot of people just put a period right there. And it has a little bit more to it. When it works together for good, it's to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. The, so understand this here, and I'm going to make a bold statement. All things work together for God's glory. We understand that. But this, all things working together for good, is specifically to people who are fulfilling God's calling and that love the Lord. It says there, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So what that tells me is things may not work together for good, if we don't love God the way we should. Things may not work together for good if we're not fulfilling God's calling in our life. You know, it's amazing how in, in life, you know, we, we do things and, and God has a different place for everybody. Not everybody's going to be a pastor. Not everyone's going to be full-time in the church. Not everybody's going to be a teacher or deacon or, or anything like that. We, we understand that everybody has a different calling. I'm thankful for everybody and their calling within a church body. And, and some people, their calling is to, to help clean the church. You know what? I'm thankful they do that, amen? And they do a good job at it. And, and I, I'm thank, I pray that God blesses them in that. Some people, they help with welcoming visitors in, and I'm thankful we have that. that people want to help with this and with that. That's part of God's calling. So everybody has a different purpose and place within God's ministry, but also within their life, within their home, where they work, the jobs they have, and so forth. We, we understand that everybody has that and so we need to do what God has called us to do. But isn't it amazing when you're doing what God made you to do and you love the Lord, how he just always works things together for good. And even the things that appear to be bad, he works together for good. You know, it's, I use this illustration um, several times, but not all things are good, but all things work together for good. And he said again, not all things feel good not all things are good but they work together for good anytime you take a, um, some kind of uh, you know recipe I think of this individual ingredients by themselves normally aren't that good but when you put them all together they work together for good um, I was telling somebody about the how I smoke my briskets and I like to smoke brisket and they say do you have uh, do you buy any kind of seasoning or you do any kind of rubs and all that and, and I say I make my own dry rub and, and so what is it? And I don't mind telling people. Um, it's, you know, red chili powder. It's brown sugar, salt, pepper, paprika, garlic. That's my rubs whenever I do any kind of barbecue. And, uh, and I like it. But, but here's the thing. If I were just to get paprika and just take it by itself, it wouldn't be that good. <laughs> uh, you know, I even use Worcestershire sauce on it. I don't like it by itself. I know some people put it in their clam chowder. And eat. I, I can't handle it by itself. But I'll put it on my meat, and it helps it taste good. But by itself... It's not that good. By itself, just a spoonful of paprika is not that good. By, by itself, a spoonful of garlic powder isn't that good. But when you put it all together, it works together for something that's really good. And when we look at the situations of life and the trials of life that we go through, it says all things work together for good. Does it mean all things are good by themselves? It, it may be something that's very bitter. It may be something that's very hard to deal with. But when you put it all together in the grand scheme of things, all things work together for good. I'm thankful that all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything will work together for good. But it says to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
but I'm thankful for the help that God gives us. And when you read this, in verse 28 again, it says, and we know that all things work together for good. Not we hope in the sense of like wishing, um, not we think, not we wonder, not we want things to work together for good. It says that we know there's a confidence that's there that in all things, when we trust the Lord, we love the Lord, we serve the Lord, all things, the hard things, um, the, the discouraging things, the, the setbacks, all those things work together for good. Every single bit of it. And God could take a bad thing and bring a positive income or a positive outcome um, with it. He could bring a, a bad thing and make something good out of it. And so you see they're all things. Now, when you hold on to that word things there, it's actually mentioned three or three more times, so a total of four times in this passage. And when it uses that word things four more or four times total, it's talking about all things. It's talking about good and bad things. So so understand that because as we continue to read, um, some people will take one verse out of context, the, the wealth, health, and prosperity crowd, and say God's gonna give us everything we want, and that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about all these things that come into our life um, is what it's talking about. So let's continue on in verse number 29. It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Just understand this here. The predestination thing, Calvinism and so forth, that starts off by saying, whom he did foreknow. God knows who's going to get saved and who's not going to get saved. And we understand that. He doesn't make a person get saved, but he knows who's going to choose him. He knows who's going to believe on him. He knows who's going to have faith in the Lord. And based upon that foreknowledge, he's predestinated some things for those who believe. And so you see that there. And it says there, first of all, to be conformed to the image of his son. God wants us to look like Jesus. And I'm thankful uh, that we have someone to look forward to. Don't, don't try to look like me. Don't try to look like another preacher. Don't try to look like another Christian. You know, our goal is to look like Christ, to be conformed to his image. And so it goes on to say in verse number 30, uh, Moreover, um, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So, so when, when you got saved, God had a calling on your life. And, and with that calling, you see here, he justifies us. And I'm thankful that it's not my righteousness that saves me. It's his righteousness that saves me. And it says those who've been saved and called and justified, um, we're going to be glorified. Amen. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day when this corrupt body will put on incorruption and this mortal body will put on immortality. But then it says there, after all that, after all that we have, verse 31, what shall we then say to these things if God be for us who can be against us so these things all things work together for good the good and the bad all things work together for good and what shall we say to these things if God be for us who can be against us there are things that feel like they are against us but understand this here if God's for us who could be against us if these things are there in our life that hurt and set back and discourage and we all have them just recognize this even though those things are there God is still for us amen and if God be for us who can be against us and I heard it said you know um, me and God are the majority amen and it's not because of me it's because of God and I'm thankful for that and so um, we see all these things come and these things could be hard, but even in these things, God is for us. We, we see God helping us through these things. And now this is the next verse where people, they take it out of context, but verse 32, it says, He that spared not his own son. What does that mean, spared not his own son? What's that? No, no. Spared not his own son. Notice it's a capital S. It's talking about the Son of God. He that spared not his own son. Anyone know what that would mean? Yes, sir. What's the capital S? It's talking about the Father and the Son Jesus, very specifically. Right there, that's the second part right there. God didn't spare his son. Yes. From what? From death. From Calvary. And so... You were going to say something, Brother James? 
for us all. Yeah. So there's the next part of it there. So he, he spared him not. He delivered him up for us all. Where did he deliver him to? What did he deliver him to? To the cross. So it's saying here, if God was willing to allow his own son to go to Calvary, it says, uh, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is the context. If he's willing to let his son go to Calvary, God's going to let us go through things as well. And that's where it says there, shall freely give us all things. Now, people take that little statement and say, God's going to freely give me all things. And, and they take it totally out of context. And that's not what it's talking about. It's saying, all things work together for good. And he's trying to encourage us because not all things are good. And he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Actually, I skipped, a spot. Oh, I skipped ahead. It says, uh, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So there's things that are negative that feel like they're against us, but God is for us. And then he says, but even his own son, he allowed to go to Calvary. And if he allowed him to go through those things, isn't he going to allow us to go through things as well? And then he goes on to describe some of those things. Let's continue on in verse 33. Um, who shall lay any elect to his charge, the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. We understand here that God allows things. Um, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, which we're celebrating. We thank the Lord for the resurrection. Um, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Notice that key word there, also. In the beginning of what our lesson, we saw the Spirit making intercession. It says also His Son making intercession. We have God's Spirit speaking on our behalf. We have God's Son speaking on our behalf. He's helping us. Why? Because of the things that we go through in life. And it says there in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he lists a bunch of things. So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. What's that? Going through things we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, and all these, here's that word again, things. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Being a Christian doesn't mean life is going to be easy. Not one bit. We all go through things. But I'm thankful in the things that we go through, we have help from the Lord. The Spirit is making intercession. The, the Son is making intercession. The Father didn't withhold anything from the Son. He's not going to withhold bad things from us. But as we go through these things, it says there, if God be for us, who could be against us? And then it says in 37, and all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And he listed things. You think about that. Tribulation. That's, that's not talking about the tribulation. It's just talking about tribulations that we go through. Trials and, and hardship. And then it says there, um, you know, tribulation and distress. You ever been stressed out? Amen. And, and in hard times. And then it says there, persecution. And that's something they saw very much in biblical times. And let me say this. With the exception of America, for the most part, persecution is across the world for Christianity and I believe it may come here to America as well. Famine, you know, that, that's just something that happens. The amount of famine you can't necessarily control whenever crops aren't going to yield or things like that, but sometimes there's a, a, a lack in, in provision. And then it says nakedness, you know, just not having enough to have clothes and, and then the persecution, sometimes they'd even strip them of their naked of their clothes and, and uh, abuse them and, and that kind of stuff. And then it says or peril, you know, perilous times and danger, um, sword. And there's all these things that happen, but yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors uh, through him that loved us. God helps us in these things. And all things work together for good to them that love him, where they're called according to his purpose. So this is a promise we have. Do we believe this? Do we honestly believe that God works in these things? Do we believe that he hears us? Do we believe in the hope that he's coming again? You know, sometimes as you go through things, it shakes your faith. And it shakes, do I really believe these things of God, not things that we're dealing with, but the things of God. I've expressed this before, but I have a friend of mine that he um, had a, they had adopted some children, and um, long story short, the children made a false accusation, these, uh, or they were fostering and adopting, made a false accusation, state came in in California, took away his biological children and the foster and adopted children, 
and for over a year their kids were in the state system including his own biological children and he got to the point where he questioned everything and he says I even question God and my faith and he says but when I questioned God and my faith God didn't let me go and, and he's still serving the Lord today he's still faithful to the Lord today but sometimes big things happen huge things things that will rock your world things that will, will shake you entirely and when you look at that that's just how life is and I wish it wasn't so I hear stories I, I know multiple things about um, people that uh, they, they tell me their story as a pastor and they confide and I pray with them it's like man this is huge and and I could only take you to the Lord and help him to or ask him to help you carry the the burden because I, I, I can't do anything for you other than pray even the little bit of help that I offer is not going to help compared to what you're going through there there comes a point when things like money and so forth just don't help you just you need God to to do the work and there's nothing you can really do other than just let God do it and but yet in those things the Bible says we're more than conquerors through him that loved us do we really believe this do we really trust the Lord do we really uh, have an anchor in the Lord and and, and have confidence in him that he's going to work all things together for good. Do we have this faith and say, I know this is going to work together for good. I don't know how, but I know that it will. I'm going to trust the Lord and all these things. God is for us. Who can be against us? Uh, he gave these things to a son. He's going to give things to me. But yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's a promise we have of the Lord and faith. And so we have a, a hope of the Lord. We are heard by the Lord we have help from the Lord and ultimately we are his amen look at verse 38 and 39 it says therefore I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let me say this here, there's nothing that can separate you from Jesus. And I'm thankful that I belong to him. Because there's times when you go through things and it seems like you're just out there on your own, but even in those times, nothing will separate you from his love. And I'm thankful for that abiding love that is inseparable. He mentions things, and death is the final enemy. And yet even that won't separate us from his love. Why? Well, he lives. And because he lives, we live. Amen. I'm thankful for that. But then in life, in this life, there are things, but those things don't separate us. And angels, now, we understand there are um, angels of the Lord. There's fallen angels. But regardless, they're supernatural beings. And even those things that are beyond us can't separate us from God. And it says principalities and powers. That's earthly authorities in this world. Understand this here there's been many times where persecution has taken place and they've done everything they can to remove uh, people uh, from their faith in the Lord and they can strip everything from them and yet people even in dungeon cells and prisons uh, still hold on to their faith in the Lord why because nothing will separate us from the love of Christ Amen. I'm thankful uh, for that and it says there um, or th no things present nor things to come things today that you're dealing with and things tomorrow that we don't know what's going to happen that could be a life-changing day tomorrow even that isn't going to separate us uh, from the love of Christ. And then he says height or depth. You know, he's talking about, you know, we're not going to be separated from him in the top of the mountains or the bottom of the sea um, or any other creature. Uh, whatever animals that are out there shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing, nothing that can separate us from Christ's love. I'm so thankful uh, for that because there's a lot of things in this world that are painful that hurt, that are discouraging. He lists a bunch of things. In the previous verses, he lists things that we see in life, and yet none of those things will separate us from God's love. I'm thankful for that. Now, let me say this. Um, God didn't love me because I was worthy of his love. God didn't love you because you're worthy of his love. God loved us because God loves us, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that and we consider that we read the verse, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It says in 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. He demonstrated the love 
uh, toward us. He not only demonstrated it by saying it, he demonstrated it by giving his son for us. And when you look at that, there's no greater love than that, to, to give your life. And, and, and Jesus, the Bible says he loved his own to the very end. Uh, he, he loved us, as it said, to death. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. And, and let me say this, he still loves us. There's nothing that's going to separate uh, that love for you and for me. I, I'm thankful for that. And because of that, you know, we, we belong to him. We belong to him. And, you know, there's times whenever, you know, you, you belong to a certain group. You know, we, we as a church body, we, we belong uh, to, to our church here. Uh, but understand this here. Organizations can come and go. Uh, people come and go. The Lord doesn't come and go. Hey, man, we, he, he abides forever. We, we belong to him because things change. I think about um, even in our own ministry what we had in Taos. We planted a church. It was a solid church. There was a, a core group that was there, had a building. Things were set up uh, for whoever came in to, to continue on the work of the ministry. Sadly, within nine months, the person who, who took the work on, they said they were going to do certain things, and they didn't do a single thing they told us. They, they lied to us, basically. And within nine months, the church doors were closed. And I look at that. It's sad to see that. There's still some people that are up in Taos that don't have a church to go to now. And, and they, they sometimes they go to Española and things like that. And it's sad that things like that happen. It really is. And I'm not trying to put the man down, but what I'm saying is this. Things come and go. But let me say this. Those people that are up in Taos that went to our church, does God love them any less? No, does God still love them? Is God still going to help them? Is God still going to take care? Absolutely, He still will. And, and that shows that our confidence is in Christ and our confidence is in God and, and what He has done for us and what He's doing on our behalf in all these things that we go through. And I'm thankful that I could trust Him because not everything makes sense. Not, not everything is understand. I don't understand why God allowed that to happen. I don't understand why, why certain things have happened in our own family. Like I mentioned, you know, when we started our church, the very first um, service we had, right before, we had a miscarriage. Uh, right, the Friday night, um, May 16th, we had a miscarriage. May 18th was our opening day for our service. I don't understand why that happened. Um, there's a lot of things like that that have happened in ministry. I have no clue. All I know is that God is working all things together for good. And I'm thankful um, for what he's doing and even to the point where sometimes even the hard things we need to thank God for because somehow in those things he's working all things together for good I know of a man who had a brain tumor and um, it was about the size of an orange and they took out 90% of it he was praying to God that they'd take out 100% the doctors were rejoicing that they were able to take out 90% without killing him because it was in a very you know, important area. I mean, the brain obviously is important, but where it was at was extremely vital. They were rejoicing that they got 90% out. He was discouraged that they left 10% in. You know, that, that was, and he was discouraged for a long time. But eventually he came to terms and said, I'm going to accept this. And he got to the point where he would thank God for brain cancer and thank God for his tumor. And he, he was an evangelist. He'd go around preaching and he would give that testimony and it helped so many people, and God used that. In his, his last maybe 10 years of ministry, God used him in 10 years of ministry more than God had used him in his 30 years before that. And God used him in those 30 years prior, but those last 10 years, he had the hand of God upon him in a way that is unreal. And it, it started whenever he started thanking God for things that are uncomfortable, for things that hurt. So all these things come. Um, do we trust the Lord in these things? Or, or do we know that all things work together. Do we really believe that? Do we believe that we belong to Him, that He hears us and helps us in all these things? And, and so we need to trust the Lord in these things. That's just some promises we have. Amen? So I want to encourage you today um, as we go about our, our day and our life, just know all things work together for good to them that love Him who are called according to His purpose. And so with that, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to you, Lord, I thank you, God, for...